And that's the God that we serve. He did that for us. Absolutely. So, today we celebrate the Resurrection Day, which most people call Easter, right? Um, some people say, well, it's not really Easter. is the, the pagan holiday. We celebrate the Resurrection Day. But, so the question I want to start with this morning is, is it okay to use the word Easter? Is it okay? Well, it's in the King James Version of the Bible. And uh, this is King James here. It's even large print so I can read it. In Acts chapter 12 and verse 4. And the scripture says, And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quintarians of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now, uh, that has to do, in the English translations, the same verse, or the, the, the newer, modern English translations, uses the word Passover. So the, the misunderstanding comes from the translations. It really has to do with, Easter has to do with the Passover, the moon thing, and all that kind of stuff. So it's a transition issue, and, and you need to be deep in study and prayer to understand. But most of the things I've studied coming to this point say that the King James translation isn't right using the word Easter. So... So we're going to define Easter. If you look at Webster's New American Dictionary, it's described and defined as a church feast observed on a Sunday in March or April in commemoration of Christ's resurrection. The American Dictionary of the English language says it's a festival of Christian church observed in commemoration of our Savior's resurrection. And the American uh, Dictionary of the English Language goes on with a second definition that does touch and, and describe the pagan uh, festival that happens in. So, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. There's a lot of room for debate there, you know, with the translations and stuff, and over the years, you know, uh, we use the English Standard Version, uh, we started this ministry with the NIV, um, but here a number of years ago, they were threatening to rewrite it again to include all the transgender and gay and all that LBGT alphabet kind of stuff. And uh, we decided at that point it was time to get away from it. And as we researched it, according to everything that we studied and all the major churches and missions and stuff that have gone to it, the English Standard Version is the most accurate word-for-word -word and phrase-for-phrase -phrase translation of the original scripture. You know, I've been told many, many times, well, you need to use the original Bible. Well, I would, but I can't read Hebrew and Greek. You know? And that's, you know, and that's the original, because the King James Version is, is a translation as well. I don't want to start a debate, but that's just the facts, okay? And if you've been using it all your life, and, and you're living well with the Lord, God bless you, keep on using it, you know? So, so, okay? So, here's the point between Easter and Resurrection Day. <coughs> it's not as much about the word that we use, it's about what it means to you. What does it mean to you? Is Easter about bunnies and eggs and a meal afterwards? Or is Easter about the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? See, that's what the difference is. It's not about the title for the day. It's about our hearts. Amen? Amen. And that's what we need to look at you know, when we think about it. It is the resurrection that day. But we celebrate it as Easter. Somatics, right? But if our heart is right, and we're celebrating together as brothers and sisters, like-minded, in the finished work of Jesus Christ, and we are praising God for what he did, that's what it's about. That's what it's about. Turn with me to Matthew, chapter 28. We're going to look at the scripture 
verses 1 through 40. Matthew 28, beginning at verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and uh, the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for him, and for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and ran to tell his disciples, and behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. And while they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priest all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell the people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were sleeping. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came, to, came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So as, as we look at this in verse 6, the angel declared to the women, he is not here, he has risen. So if, if Easter means anything, it means Jesus Christ is Lord. He says that right in, in the, the thing. Jesus Christ is Lord. He has authority over life, death, and salvation. He does. Amen? Amen? Yeah. And we count on that, right? The scriptures stress that Jesus actually rose from the dead. It's all through the New Testament. Our, our entire faith base is on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, if it wasn't for that, we'd be just like the Buddhists and, and the other people. You know, their leaders and, and the people that they worship. They are dead. They're gone. They have full tombs. We serve the Lord that left an empty tomb. So this, the scriptures stress that Jesus actually rose. The Apostle Paul said it was the basis of his personal faith. The Apostle Paul is one we study greatly as we study the New Testament. And he listed the many eyewitnesses of Christ's resurrection. If you look at 1 Corinthians... Chapter 15 and verses 3 through 8. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 through 8. The Apostle writes, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. And then he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some had fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. He appeared to Paul on the Damascus road that day. 
and that was different than the rest of them. A time had passed. So it's based on it. Paul based his faith. All the other, you know, it said that some didn't believe some of the other apostles. Jesus' own brothers didn't believe most of them until after he was resurrected, that he was the promised Messiah, the coming one. The empty tomb convinced Jesus' disciples of his lordship. And we're told that in Romans chapter 1 and verse 4. Romans chapter 1 and verse 4 says this, speaking of Jesus, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. He is Lord. And his resurrection proved that. Other, no other people don't come back from the dead. It would be real handy if they did, wouldn't it? A lot of people talk about the afterlife and that, but nobody really knows. It would be awesome to have somebody that was authentic. They had been to heaven and come back. The Apostle John did some. But to be able to tell us, this is what you're going to go through. This is what it's like to walk with the Lord. But because of Jesus and his resurrection, it proved that he had lordship over all of us. You see, this message of the Easter resurrection is that Jesus is alive today. Yeah. Scripture tells us he's in heaven, sitting at the right hand of the Father, waiting for the word to come back and get us. Who are waiting for him. He is our living Lord and Savior. He has the power to resurrect us from death to life. In, in the Gospel of John, in verse, uh, chapter 5 and verse 24, Jesus makes a statement. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but it has passed from death to life. As we believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we're not going to die. We may, be, we may step out of these physical, earthly bodies we have today, but we're not done yet. Jesus says in, in John chapter 11, verse 25 and 6, I am the resurrection. Whoever believes in me, even though he should die, he will not perish. He will live. Kind of paraphrased there. But, you know, what's that mean? It means that because of Jesus' finished work, if we believe in that, we have eternal life ahead of us. Friday was Good Friday, last Friday. Cruci it's Crucifixion Day, is the other name. Some of us went to the First Baptist Church in Otsego here and held a service. I know they were all over the place, but we attended that one in. Uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a sad section of the resurrection account for Friday. Is. You know, um, as we think about the price that Jesus paid just getting to the cross, you know, he was arrested, wrongly, tried, falsely. He was beaten within an inch of his life. Scripture tells us almost unrecognizable as a man, he was beaten so bad before he went to the cross on our behalf. And that's what Good Friday is. Doesn't make sense it is, other than the fact that he did it for us. But you see, that part is only part of the story. Well, I'll give you an example here. Uh, the story is told that in the, to carry the news of the Battle of Waterloo, okay, and uh, the news was sent to England uh, from a sailing ship. And it was signaled, I can't think, I don't know what, they can't remember the name of it, you know how they did that with the lights and stuff and flags. They, they signaled a guy that was standing on the shore. The guy on the shore then signaled it on up to a hilltop to a guy who was there, and then he sent it out. And that's the way the news of this Battle of Waterloo got all across England, okay? So the first guy relayed uh, the word uh, Wellington, and Wellington is the commander, Arthur 
Wellesley is the Duke of Wellington at that time. Okay? And the first word was Wellington, was signal. Okay? And the next word he sent was defeated. But then the fog settled in on the water. And the signals were stopped. So all across England, through that time period, the message was going, Wellington defeated. But the thing that happened, the, the people wept, they carried on, but then the fog lifted. And the communication continued with two additional words. The two additional words were as simple as the enemy. Wellington defeated the enemy. And then all of England rejoiced. And they pardoned and they, they were happy in the victory that happened. See, there was great sorrow when the body of Jesus was carried from the cross to the tomb. The signal seemed to say that day, Jesus Christ crucified and dead. It was true at that point. However, three days later, the fog lifted. And the angel announced to the women, Jesus Christ defeated the enemy. Amen. Amen. Absolutely, amen. And we count on that. That's why we can walk in victory today. Just as in the, the short story there, when England got the rest of the message, they were able to celebrate in victory. We can do that today because of what Jesus Christ did on our behalf. Verse 7 of, of uh, Matthew 28 Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. See, the angel instructs the ladies, the women that are there, to go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. Why? Why would he do that? Well, <coughs> one reason was so that they could share the good news with other people. And they did. We know that. Paul also wanted them and us to understand and be reminded that his resurrection, Jesus' resurrection, is directly connected to ours. And we can see that in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 23. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 23 says this, But each in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Our bodies will be resurrected when Christ comes back. Scripture tells us that in 1 Thess Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. Excuse me. <coughs> when, when Christ comes back, it says the dead in Christ will rise first. And then those of us who are left will be changed. And we will meet him in the air. And we will be with the Lord forever. That means there's no more death for us. Christ is the first fruit. That means if Jesus, our Lord and Savior, with his victory over death, it's also our victory over death. Permanent death. It doesn't exist for us. We will have eternal life because of our belief and faith in what Jesus did. See, Jesus came... To bring life to us. A new spiritual life. To all who believe him. In John chapter 10 and verse 10. Jesus said. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life. And have it abundantly. We're not just a wander through life. And, and, and just be busted down. And, and not have any joy in our heart. Or any uh, caring for other people. Jesus wants us to live abundantly. And that's not it. He didn't say financially successful in a big fancy house, driving a new truck or anything like that. He wants us to live abundantly. About how we think. About how we live our life. How we care for one another. 
How do we get that in life? Well, to know Jesus Christ and have a relationship with him means to be resurrected with him. We're told that in Romans. Romans chapter 6, verse 4 through 6. Romans 6, 4 through 6. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. So in order that just as Christ is raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. In newness of life. When we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and then we, we are publicly baptized, and we confess that faith to everybody that can hear it, we have newness of life. I don't know about y'all, but the life I lived before Christ, running with the world and doing all the things that they told me was fun and all that stuff, I never want to go back to that. And I pray that other people never have to go back to that. Newness of life. What would that look like? Newness of life. Well, for one thing, we would live with a higher moral standard. Colossians chapter 3, verses 10 through 17. Colossians 3, 10 through 17. It hath put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, by bearing, circadian slave, free, but Christ is all in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord's forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. See, as we're resurrected with Christ into a new life, even as we're still walking this, we are to live that way. We have a new heart. We have a new heart so that we can live Christ's life. So why in, in Romans chapter 8, we'll go there for a minute. See, the Colossians thing is proof that the Holy Spirit indwells us. We talked about that, right? I want to go there a lot right now, but we talked about that from Galatians. Crucifying the flesh. We did that last week, didn't we? That's done. We no longer carry that. So what do we replace it with? Colossians. Colossians 3, 10 through 17. Because here's the thing about replacing it. Nature will not stay in a vacuum. If we try to take something bad out of our life, if we don't replace it with something good, that comes right back. This is the way it works. So we need to replace the bad things in our life with the new creation that we are that's listed in Colossians. Romans chapter 8 in verses uh, 14 through 17 says this, if we do this, if we do this, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as son, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. If we live this new life of following and living by the Spirit, we are sons and daughters of God. Pretty amazing, isn't it? To be known as a son and daughter of God. Why would we be called sons and daughters of God? 
Because we believe in the life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? God says if you believe this in your heart, then you strive to live this way. I've got another brief story here. At the close of World War I, the French army had hundreds of soldiers suffering from amnesia, okay? Because of shell shock is what caused it. A faulty record system lost the identity of these poor war victims. So the story goes that to find their families and return to their homes, they held an identification rally. <coughs> an identification rally. And it was scheduled to happen in Paris. Thousands of relatives gathered in this big plaza place, and they had a huge, high up so everybody could see platform. And each and every individual soldier that was suffering from amnesia was taken up on that platform and they all said the same phrase. Is there anyone here who can tell me who I am? Is there anyone here who can tell me who I am? Let me ask you, who are you? Who are you? Jesus Christ died and rose again to tell us who we really are. We are sons and daughters of God. Friends, that's what Easter is really about. Doesn't matter if you call it Easter. Doesn't matter if you call it Resurrection Day. And in the, in the Hebrew language, there's other terms that they use. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is proof that God the Father accepted Jesus' sacrifice to pay our sin debt. When Jesus said on the cross it is finished, the Father accepted that payment. Held death in the grave, it been defeated. See, we can believe that, and you can still have the bunnies, the eggs, and the meal. But please, we need to make sure you first and foremost get right with God through Jesus Christ. That's the main thing about Easter. That's the main thing about the resurrection. Jesus Christ did that. But that free gift of God and the gift Jesus Christ gave us by staying on the cross until it was done is of no value if you don't accept it. So we have to do that. My prayer would be that everybody sitting here this morning is a son or a daughter of God, that they have accepted that. Maybe you have, maybe you have. This morning we want to give you, I want to give you the opportunity to do that. And it can be done with a simple prayer. I would ask that you bow your head and close your eyes. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, what a great day to do. You can be resurrected to new life today. Please, if you need a Savior today, pray with me. Heavenly Father, I come to you this morning. And I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I have not been following your word. I know that I have no relationship with Jesus Christ. Father, I want to change. I want to get away from my worldly life and begin to follow Jesus' path. Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart and be my personal Lord and Savior. I pray that you will help me to become resurrected, a new person. I ask you to be the manager and controller of my life. Father, I want to thank you for saving me. Jesus, I thank you for loving and caring for me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time today, I want to thank you and I want to welcome you to the family of God. You have become a son of God. That's a very special precious thing.
I also want to take just a moment. I had prayed that prayer once in my life, and then I kind of, after a short time, ran away from it. And I didn't know how to get back. And, and many of you have heard this story many times, but it's, it's true, and it's my path. Char and I were at a motorcycle rally, and the evangelist got up and told a story very similar to mine. You know, the names and the dates were changed to protect the innocent. But, you know, in my life, there wasn't any innocence at that time. And he said, you know, I, couldn't know, I didn't know how to get back to Jesus. And a fellow offered a prayer of rededication. And he prayed a prayer of rededication. And that day, I gave my heart back to the Lord. And the newness came. I became resurrected that day. Amen. And it began to change. And I want to offer you that opportunity. Sometimes we get lost. And without a map, without a, comp without a compass, we can't find our way out. Google is great, but Google can't get you back to Jesus. Only you can do that. Please follow me one more time. Heavenly Father, pray with me if you, if you need to reconnect. Heavenly Father, I come to you this morning. I believed I was one of your children. I want to be one of your children. I prayed the prayer, but I did not live the life. There was no resurrection in my life. I felt no Holy Spirit. But Father, regardless of the reason for the separation, right here, right now, I rededicate my life to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, I pray that you will take control, that you will help me walk that narrow path, that I will become renewed because of your shed blood. In Jesus' name, I pray this. I would encourage you, if you pray to Peter one of them prayers, even if, you, if you're here visiting, I would encourage you that you be at a Bible-teaching, Jesus-preaching church. Don't have to be this one. There's other ones in the world. I think this is the best one, but, you know, that's okay. I, I can have my opinion. But we need to learn the Word of God. If they're not teaching you the Word of God, if they're teaching you of a risen, alive Jesus Christ, you need to change. That's just a fact, folks. So in a minute, we're going to celebrate at the Lord's table. At the Passover... Jesus instituted this. He left two ordinances for the church. One was communion, and the other was baptism. We're coming to springtime. I'm hurrying this, but um, uh, coming to springtime about midsummer. We usually do a baptism service. If you have not been baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, let me know. We can do that for you. We usually go to Snobble Lake. The whole group of us after church. Can we do that? The only requirement is that you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you're willing to say that. Baptism is a public expression of what we feel inside. And we need to do that. We believe in and teach the baptism by immersion. And, uh, so think about that. Pray about that. If you need to be baptized, we can make that happen for you. But we are going to observe communion at this time. The men would come forward. We serve, we serve a communion, it's known as an open communion. The only requirement that we have is that you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You don't have any membership. This is about the relationship that you personally have with God the Father through Jesus Christ. So as the men pass the elements out, I would encourage you to look inside. To look inside. Are you functioning as a son or a daughter today? If you have a bad relationship with going on, just pass it on until you get an opportunity to work that out and we will be good. Ted, would you pray for the body, please? Father, we uh, come to you on this special day of remembering what you went through, Father. We're following your direction that uh, we get together, Father, and we do this in remembrance of you. And we have the blessing upon each one of us and on this, what we do. Father, we pray in your name. Amen. <coughs>
For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And he is coming. We need to remember that. Right? I would encourage you as you celebrate your victory in Christ today that you remember he is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. All right. God bless you. Uh, I'll close in prayer. If the ladies want to come up and lead a song as we file out of here, that'd be great. Come on up and we'll do that. All right. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you again. And Lord, we want to thank you and praise you for the great privilege we have to be able to call ourselves sons and daughters of the living God. Father, we thank you that Jesus Christ arose on Resurrection Day. And through his victory over death, we claim that, Father. Father, we believe in our hearts and in our souls, and we pray, Father, that you help us through the leading of the Holy Spirit to live lives that prove it, that we are your children, blood-bought children of the King. It's in Jesus' name, our Savior, Father, that we pray this. All people said, Amen. Amen. Go ahead,